The Blue Hole is a 100 metre deep sinkhole on the coast of the Red Sea, five miles north of Dahab, Egypt. Its nickname is the Divers Cemetery. Divers in Dahab say 200 died in recent years. Many of those who died were attempting to swim under the arch. Many certified scuba divers think they are capable of just going a little deeper, but they don't know that there are special gas mixtures, buoyancy equipment and training required for just another few meters of depth. Imagine this, you take your paddy open water diving course and you learn your dive charts, buy all your own gear and become familiar with it. Compared to the average person on the street, you're an expert now. You go diving on coral reefs, a few shipwrecks, and even catch lobster in New England. You go to visit a deep spot like this, and you're having a great time. You see something just in front of you, this beautiful cave with sunlight streaming through, and you decide to swim just a little bit closer. You're not going to go inside it, you know better than that, but you just want a closer look. If your dive computer starts beeping, you'll just head back up. So, you swim a little closer, and it's breathtaking. You're enjoying the view, and just floating there, taking it all in. You hear a clanging sound. It's your dive master, wrapping the butt of his knife on the tank, to get someone's attention. You look up to see what he wants, but after staring into the darkness for the last minute, the sunlight streaming down is blinding. You turn away, and reach to check your dive computer, but it's a little awkward for some reason, and you twist your shoulder and pull it towards you. It's beeping, and the screen is flashing, go up. You stare at it for a few seconds, trying to make out the depth and tank level between the flashing words. The numbers won't stay still. It's really annoying, and your brain isn't getting the info you want at a glance. So, you let it fall back to your left shoulder, turn towards the light and head up. The problem is that the blue hole is bigger than anything you've ever dove before and the crystal clear water provides a visibility that is ten times what you're used to in the dark waters of St Lawrence where you usually dive. What you don't realise is that when you swam down a little farther to get a closer look, thinking it was just 30 or 40 feet more, you actually swam almost twice that because the vast scale of things messed up your sense of distance and while you were looking at the archway you didn't have any nearby reference points in your vision. More depth equals more pressure and your BCD, the air filled jacket that you used to control your buoyancy, was compressed a little. You were slowly sinking and had no idea. That's when the dive master began banging his tank and you looked up. This only served to blind you for a moment and distract your sense of motion and position even more. Your dive computer wasn't sticking out on your chest below your shoulder when you reached for it, because your BCD was shrinking. You turned your body sideways while twisting and reaching for it. The ten seconds spent fumbling for it and staring at the screen brought you deeper, and you began to accelerate with your jacket continuing to shrink. The reason that you didn't hear the beeping at first, and that it took you so long to make out the depth between the flashing words, was the nitrogen narcosis. You have been getting depth drunk, and the numbers wouldn't stay still, because you are still sinking. You swim towards the light, but the current is pulling you sideways. Your brain is hurting, straining for no reason, and the blue hole seems like it's gotten narrower, and the light rays above you are going at a funny angle. You kick harder just to keep going up, towards the light, despite this damn current that wants to push you into the wall. Your computer is beeping incessantly, and it feels like you're swimming through mud. Screw this. You grab the fill button on your jacket and squeeze it. You're not supposed to use your jacket to ascend. As you know, it will expand as the pressure drops, and you'll need to carefully bleed off air to avoid shooting up to the surface. But you don't care about that anymore. Shooting up to the surface is exactly what you want right now, and you'll deal with bleeding air off and making depth stops when you're back up with the rest of your group. The sound of air rushing into your BCD fills your ears, but nothing's happening. Something doesn't sound right, 
like the air isn't filling fast enough. You look down at your jacket, searching for whatever the trouble might be, when you bump right into the side of the giant sinkhole. What the hell? Why is the current pulling me sideways? Why is there even a current in an empty hole in the middle of the ocean? You keep holding the button, hoping it inflates. Your computer is now making a frantic screeching sound that you've never heard before. You notice that you've been breathing heavily. It's a sign of stress, and the sound of air rushing into your jacket is getting weaker. Every 10 meters of water adds another one atmosphere of pressure. Your tank has enough air for you to spend an hour at 10 meters, and to refill your BCD more than 100 times. Each additional 20 meters of depth cuts this time in half. This assumes that you're calm, controlling your breathing, and using your muscles slowly with intention. If you panic, begin breathing quickly and move rapidly. This cuts your time in half again. You're certified to 20 meters, and you've gone briefly down to 30 meters on some shipwrecks before, so you were comfortable swimming to 25 meters to look at the arch. While you were looking at it, you sank to 40 meters and while you messed around looking for your dive master and then the computer, you sank to 60 meters. Six atmospheres of pressure. You have only 10 minutes of air at this depth. When you swam for the surface, you had become disoriented from twisting around and then looking at your gear and you were now right in front of the archway. You swam into the archway thinking it was the surface. That's why the blue hole looks smaller now. There's no current pulling you sideways you're continuing to sink to the bottom of the arch. When you hit the bottom and started to inflate your BCD, you are now over 90 meters. You will go through a full tank of air in only a couple of minutes at this depth. Panicking like this, you're down to seconds. There's enough air to inflate your BCD, but it will take over a minute to fill. And it doesn't matter, because that would only pull you into the top of the arch, and you'll drown before you get there. Holding the inflate button, you kick as hard as you can for the light. Your muscles are screaming, your brain is screaming, and it's getting harder and harder to suck each panicked breath out of your regulator. In a final fit of rage and frustration, you scream into your useless reg, darkness squeezing into the corners of your vision. Four minutes. That's how long your dive lasted. You died in clear water on a sunny day in only four minutes. I was supervising on evening shift in a small town in rural Australia. We have a large river that snakes its way past the town and runs close to some of the residential areas. It's a kilometre wide in some parts, has steep banks and thick bush in the bed when it's dry. One of my crews were tied up with something and the other was attending two brothers threatening to harm themselves after having a fight at a residence near the bank of the river. I heard the job and attended to give my crew a hand. Upon arrival, we found one brother who was self-harming and on drugs. We restrained him. He was taken to hospital via ambulance for mental health. As we had made the apprehension, my crew had to accompany the ambulance for everyone's safety. My crew leaves and then I'm told by the family that the other brother had run off down the river dry bank. The family said he was drunk, but didn't have anything to actually harm himself with. I was concerned, and attended the riverbank near where they thought he went down. Both crews were busy, and I was by myself at night, and it started to rain lightly. I parked my unit at the top of the bank, with the lights pointed onto the bush, hoping that if he saw my lights, he'd come towards me. I got out my torch, and made my way down the bank. I found a small clearing and a small distance away was thick bush. I heard something moving. It sounded like something taking deliberate steps in the bush. I yelled out, thinking it was the guy I was after. I told him I was here to help, and pleaded with him to come out. No response, and when I was talking, whatever it was stopped moving. I kept talking, attempting to make contact, as my instincts told me someone was in the thick bush in front of me. Still no response. My torch couldn't penetrate the bush, but I could hear distinct footfalls. I stopped making any noise, turned off my light, and stood still, listening. 
I hear movement coming towards me in the bush. I remain still and listen. It came closer. Without thinking, my hand went down to my gun and I was ready to draw. I turned on my light and walked forward and hear whatever it was move away from me. I backed off, turned off my light and remained silent. It started coming closer to me, probing my position. I repeated the exercise once more and once more it backed off and came back at a different angle. By this stage I was on high alert. Something told me to get out of dodge. I got this heavy, eerie feeling. Any animal that was down there would have run off upon my approach. No animal I know approaches or probes a human's position at nights like that. Once I got the overwhelming feeling to leave, I backed off with my hand on my gun and I didn't turn my back until I had to climb up the bank. Once at the top and back with my car, I felt a lot better, but I could still hear something moving in the bush. I stayed there for a while as I was curious. I left and conducted inquiries, eventually finding the missing brother on the other side of town, fast asleep and fine. To this day, I don't know what I ran into down in the riverbed that night. I went on a group retreat over a full weekend about eight years ago. Husband and I and our three girls, all under age ten. This was an annual occurrence, but we were flush that year as a result of our company doing well. As a result, we avoided the communal bunkhouses and decided to rent a camper. The RV rental place explained it would cost the same for three nights as it would for two, so we decided we'd return it on the Monday, despite the retreat being over earlier on the Sunday. So, the weekend went great. It was super hot and we were happy to have AC. We didn't notice it at the time, with different people being in and out all day, not staying in the RV much over the weekend because of activities but the previous renters hadn't bothered to clear out the septic lines in the camper. By Sunday evening, it stunk horribly and was backing up into the toilet. My husband was anxious about the rental company blaming us, so he decided to go to the Walmart in the neighbouring town for some Drano. Mind you, this particular location, while open all year, is rarely occupied outside of retreats. I'll confess that we haven't been back since this occasion, so the details of why don't really come to mind. But as I recall, it was privately owned by a church in the area, and they used it mostly for their own purposes and events. So, my husband leaves at about half past eight for Walmart. It's an hour plus round trip, thanks to the rural area and skinny back roads. I start straightening the camper, packing our belongings, and getting the kids settled. He'd been gone for about 40 minutes, when I'd got everything squared away, and delivered the last glass of water to an overexcited child who'd been on the move all day and was having trouble relaxing. I curled up in the bed to read and wait for my husband to get back in case he needed help. The lights had been out for about 20 minutes when I started hearing a clicking sound coming from the window behind the bed. I stilled instantly and ran through a self-reassuring checklist. It's the trees scraping the glass, nature, a sound in the environment nearby or an axe murderer. That was an option too. I got up and walked very slowly to the kitchen. The noise followed. As I was climbing up into the loft area over the truck can, I heard the door handle rattle, and then the scraping sound. I'd gotten a knife as I passed through the kitchen, which I was clutching as I holed down on the edge of the bed in the loft, guarding my children. I eyed the cabin, making sure every access point was locked and hoped whoever it was, it was definitely a whoever at this point, would go away. I leaned left and right, trying to get signal on my cell phone to call camp security, or my husband, or anyone, but it wouldn't dial. I waited, panicking. It was about five minutes of torture later that I saw headlights through the portholes on the side. Coming along the winding road to the RV sites, and my husband entered the cabin, looking at me weird. He scoffed at me for being a city girl and told me that people didn't break out of prison and attack women and children in random rural campgrounds. I expressed that I'd heard the door rattling and that it wasn't a coincidence of nature, but he brushed me off. We passed the rest of the night without incident, though I was too on edge to sleep. The next morning, we drove into the town to return the RV. 
On the once over demanded by the rental agreement, the manager came round to my husband and asked if he knew what had happened to the rear window. It seems that someone had used a switchblade or some other similar item to remove the gasket from around the window where the back bedroom was, where I'd been reading the night before. There were gashes in the paint consistent with knife marks and the gasket had been sliced off. The window lock was also damaged. It seems whoever had done it had also tried inserting the knife in the door's lock and between the jam and the lock in another attempt to gain entry. Fortunately they didn't get in and we weren't charged for the damage. Needless to say, I never consented to a solo camping trip again and always go in a larger group now, safety in numbers and all that. Still makes the hair on my neck stand up. This happened eight years ago when I was a sophomore in high school. My urbex friends and I were on a bike ride looking for cool places to explore in a dilapidated area when we discovered a really creepy cave. We eventually found out it was an old abandoned cement mine. We did some mild exploring that first day but quickly realised it would require more gear to thoroughly explore such as flashlights and respirators. About a week later five of us came back with the proper gear and a camera to see what we could find down in the mine. We discovered that there was basically one main shaft that slopes downwards and deeper into the earth so we followed that main route. It was wide enough for a car to drive down and was pretty well graded so the walking was easy. There were many rooms, old machinery and rusting equipment off of this main shaft but we mostly avoided it in the beginning, we were trying not to get lost or confused. Along the way the walls were littered with the classic abandoned graffiti, X was here, phallic drawings etc. As we got deeper and deeper though, the graffiti really thinned out. At this point the light from the entrance was long gone and we were relying solely on flashlights. The air was so stagnant and hazy with particles that the lights from our flimsy flashlights would only go 20 feet or so before getting totally obscured by dust. The glow sticks we had brought to mark our way to prevent us getting lost were also basically useless because they would disappear in the haze only a few steps after dropping them. At this point we started arguing amongst ourselves. Several of the crew were nervous about going any deeper with the air quality being so terrible and without a good way to prevent us from getting lost. We were probably about a quarter of a mile into the earth now. The rest of us managed to override that sentiment of fear by assuring them that the path was easy and straightforward so we'd have to try to get lost. We were going to rely on our level headedness, sense of direction and flashlight battery life to get out. Despite the agreement to push on it was becoming very creepy for everyone. We walked for a while in silence, hearing nothing but our own movements and the steady drip of water from somewhere in the cave. I think we were all pretty scared at this point but no longer willing to admit it to each other. Then we stumbled across something that made us all stop cold. Dug into the side of the deep stone shaft we were slowly descending was a tunnel. It was narrow, you'd have to crouch to go through it, and it was also a good few feet off the ground, so it required a scramble to reach it. But that wasn't what made us stop, it was the graffiti. We hadn't seen any for ten minutes or so, and had assumed that the artists never came this deep, but someone else clearly had and the message they left was ominous. The tunnel was lined with words written in white, all of them somehow relating to death and destruction. Scrawled through the tunnel were words like suffering, pain, plague, disease and hell. It was pretty terrifying. Who else would come this far just to write such a terrible message in a mysterious tunnel that broke from the main path? But there was no turning back now we had to see where the tunnel led. Despite our fear, we were overpowered by intense curiosity. So one by one, we crawled through the tunnel to the other side. What we found was a strange flooded chamber. Around the pool of water were many large stones, each covered with dozens of burned out tea candles. There must have been hundreds of used tea candles in the place. The walls had a few creepy monster faces, poorly graffitied on them and the tunnel entrance back to the main shaft was ringed with a spray painted blood stained mouth. What was this place? Some weird ritual site for local satan worshippers? 
an elaborate hoax set up by a bunch of kids. We couldn't find much evidence to figure it all out, and were running out of adrenaline to keep exploring. We all crawled out of that weird hellhole and back into the main shaft, where we promptly headed towards the exit. When we finally saw that pinprick of natural light coming from the real world outside, we were flooded with relief. We never did figure out what that mysterious cavern was for, and I think I'm content to leave it a mystery. No, we didn't hear any monsters in the depths of the tunnel, or find any bloody Satan praises themselves, but just finding that room, buried deep in an old forgotten mine, was enough to creep all of us out for a very long time. My wife and I are avid backpackers, and we try to put down at least one 20 to 30 mile weekend trip every month with our ultralight gear. We're fairly experienced at this point, and have had numerous semi-dangerous encounters with wildlife and other wilderness hazards. We don't get shook easily. We're hiking a ridgeline trail in the late afternoon, planning to take a turn, and head down into a drainage to camp near water before it gets dark. We've put down 10 plus miles that day, and we're fairly beat, looking forward to setting up camp and getting dinner going. We see a guy coming up the trail towards us as we turn onto the drainage trail, wearing worn out clothes. Up close, he's a white guy of kind of indeterminate age, somewhere between late thirties and late forties. We acknowledge each other and strike up a little conversation on the trail. The first thing I notice is his accent. It's clearly American, but it's not the accent of the area we're in, and it's kind of, well, old timey. There's a kind of music or a lilt to it. It's vaguely familiar, like something I've heard but can't quite recall. My wife is chatting with him while I figure his accent out, and then I notice he's covered with tattoos. Weird ones too. I have some, so I'm not one to judge someone just for having a tattoo, but I've never seen anything like those tattoos before. They're not standard, tough tattoos or pictures. It's almost like writing but not in any alphabet I've ever seen, and arranged in a way that makes me think they're also a picture if seen in full, like a magic eye game made up of some indecipherable script and inked on a man's skin. I'm now getting an itchy something is very wrong here feeling from this guy when I hear him say to my wife, there's a great campsite down by the stream, lots of campers have used it. I realise that we're an hour from sundown and at least 10 miles from anything and this guy has nothing with him. Not a backpack, not a water bottle, no warm layer, just the clothes on his back, none of which have anything distinguishing about them. No logos or visible brands of any kind, and quite worn. He's about to get overnighted on the trail without any gear of any kind, and only the campsite within six miles of where we're standing. I hear my wife say, that's where we're going to camp, thanks for the suggestion, and he smiles at us. His teeth are pointed. I assume filed, and curved inwards towards the back of his mouth. I don't mean just his incisors, I mean his front teeth on both top and bottom. I nod my agreement and say, enjoy the rest of your hike, and then we continue on. In another mile or two, we get down to the stream, and the campsite is lovely. Beautiful green grass, about three inches high, flat, dry, easy water access. However, there's no sign that anyone has camped there in a very long while. As we're looking it over, we find there are a ton of stakes in the ground. You'll usually find a stake or two at high traffic campsites, just because people forget them when they're packing up camp in the morning. We found more than 10, of wildly different ages and designs. Some old school and rusty, others new and shiny. But none of the grass is bent or broken, except where we've stepped in checking the site. Wordlessly, we both shouldered our packs and hiked another six or seven miles to the next site. I'm neither spiritual nor superstitious, but I've never had any other experience that filled me with a sense of unexplainable fear or impending doom the way this one did. Around the time I was a sophomore in high school, my parents decided to tear down our house and rebuild seeing as a lot of people in our neighbourhood were doing the same for value purposes. I'd made multiple jokes about how cool it would be to get a secret room that no one knew about, but I didn't actually expect them to take it into consideration. Turns out, they worked with a contractor, 
and ended up having an area set aside. Basically, if you were looking inside my closet and turned right, you could walk to the corner where there was a one and a half foot bar to hang clothes. If you moved these clothes, there was a wall behind that you could push open and bam, the hidden room, fully equipped with a ceiling light and electric plugs. Imagine how many games of hide and seek I won. No one ever found me. The room was my precious secret and I wasn't going to share it with any person outside of my family. Unfortunately, after a few months passed by, I began to get tired of the room. First of all, trying to squeeze past all of the clothing proved to be a pain. Then I'd have to slide through the tiny space to get into the room, which wasn't all that big itself. The magic had worn off, so I stopped entering it. Fast forward to a couple of months later, when things began to get weird. Our family had left for vacation for two weeks, so we had one of our neighbours take care of the house. We had been having a lot of crime in the area, so she occasionally stopped by just to check. When I got back home, I was exhausted and wanted nothing more than to crawl into bed. Opening the door to my room, which was dark, I noticed that something was off. I could see a faint glow coming from underneath my closet door. Okay, I thought to myself. My neighbour must have been going through my stuff, so I walked over to turn off the light, only to realise that the closet light switch was facing down. Confused, I opened the door, and to my horror, I noticed that in the corner, all of my clothes have been shoved aside, the wall to my secret room had been pushed open, and the light was on. How was this possible? No one knew of that room other than my parents and the contractor. I stood there in utter disbelief for about a minute, until I realised that my neighbour must have really explored the place. I warily made my way to turn off the light, followed by putting the wall door back in its place and moving the clothes back to their normal formation. I'm going to try and explain what happened next as best I can. Still kind of freaked out, or at least confused, I start to exit my closet. I'm standing in its frame, looking across my room into the corner, where I have an iron floor mirror. I'm looking at my reflection when I notice that the closet space behind me suddenly lights up and I hear this scraping noise, or at least I think that's what it was. My heart had been pounding so hard that my ears could only hear the rush of blood with every beat. I just remember jerking my head back inside my closet to find that all of my clothes were moved aside, the wall was pushed open, and, you guessed it, the light to my secret room was on. Once I was able to move from my petrified state, I convinced myself I had been so confused when I had initially seen the secret room open that I had really not closed it back at all. But I know I was lying to myself. Throughout the next few months, weird things kept happening. They weren't anything major, but still weird to the point where I couldn't explain it. For example, I would walk into my bathroom, only to find that my toilet seat was being left up every single time. I was assuming that my dad was coming into my room to use it, but that would mean he had a serious case of overactive bladder. When I approached him about it, he looked at me as though I was crazy, and asked why he would use my bathroom when we had one down the hall. I couldn't answer that question. There were other instances where I would wake up in the morning, only to find that on multiple occasions, my closet door was wide open. Before any of you say that's not a big deal, let me clarify that I had been slightly terrified of my closet and made sure every night that its door was closed before I went to sleep. I would check to make sure I heard the click and pull back and forth a few times to prove it had been shut all the way. There was no reason it should be wide open and there was also no explanation for why, occasionally, the light was turned on in the middle of the night. I know, I know. Malfunctioning lights and toilet seats don't come off as scary, but bear with me. I was freaked out to the point that I finally approached my mum about it, when we were both working in our downstairs office one day. Background story on her, she doesn't believe in ghosts, whatsoever. In fact, she raised me and my older brother, who had been moved out since we had lived in the new house, to think that any person who believed in ghosts was crazy. So when I tell her of my suspicions, I'm surprised when she sighs and says that she's noticed weird things have been happening too. She continued to tell me 
how when we first moved into our house, the one that we tore down, she would always hear footsteps walking around in my brother's room. This would confuse her, because he was at school every time this happened, but she could have sworn she'd hear him running around. One time, when she had walked up, toys were sprawled across his carpet. This took her by surprise, because he hadn't left his room like that before heading out. She then goes on to explain that the previous owners of the house had a young son that died in my brother's room, which is what led them to sell the house. She had never told me about that before. I'm guessing she thought I was old enough to know now and not form any irrational stories about ghosts haunting our house. If that had been her goal, I hate to inform her it absolutely did not work. At this point, I'm now positive that our house is haunted. She wrapped up her story and laughed it off as though it's silly to believe there wasn't a logical explanation to weird things happening. The footsteps coming from the old house was because it was old. The lighting and toilet issues were stemming from the fact that the house was brand new. Yeah, okay. At that point, we swivel around in our office chairs and continue working on our computers. After a minute or so, I can hear this loud, almost white noise sound. I turn to my mum, thinking she was taking a break and watching some weird video when I notice she's looking at me with the same confused face. It sounds like your shower's running, she said. My bedroom and bathroom were directly above us. Our dazed expressions stemmed from the fact that my shower hadn't worked for a good month or so. Right as she said that, the water stopped running and things went silent. And things went silent right before we heard five loud footsteps. I just remember seeing my mum turn white and immediately bolt upstairs past my dad who was sitting on the couch watching TV. I finally joined her, only to find that she was looking in my closet, under my bed, everywhere. She tried to explain to my dad what she had heard, but he insisted it was some piping issue, and she eventually believed him. There was no way that it was piping. I just kind of stayed upstairs, accepting the fact that something weird was occupying my room. Whenever I was scared as a kid, my dad always told me that in life you should not be scared of ghosts, fear the living because they can actually hurt you. In my late teenage years I came into some money after my father died and I received an inheritance from him. At the time of my dad's passing he and my mother owned a cabin up in Oregon by Mount Bachelor. The cabin had been put up for sale since my mum could no longer afford the payments and renting it out was not covering the payments either. The cabin was set to go on the market for sale in less than a month and was in the process of finalising all the paperwork. So for that month's time, the cabin was not going to be rented out any longer and was going to be vacant. I saw this as a chance to get away for a while and clear my head in light of all the things going on. I quit work, packed up my snowboarding gear, grabbed my dog and headed up in my dad's car to the cabin. Now, this was our family cabin that my parents rented out throughout the year when we weren't using it. I had keys to the cabin and also had the code for the alarms so I didn't feel the need to stop at the rental management company and inform them of my stay. This has nothing to do with the coming story but felt the need to mention it anyway. My first two days at the cabin were normal and nothing out of the unusual happened. Spent my days playing with my dog in the snow, snowboarding and the evenings playing PlayStation or listening to music, drinking and smoking out on the balcony. I'd already stocked up on food, cigarettes and liquor, so I was pretty much a shut-in, aside from the occasional out to hit the slopes. With my dog as company, I was quite content and started to feel relaxed after all the drama that had preceded my outing. The cabin itself was two storeys. The bottom storey had the living room and a side guest bedroom along with a small kitchen. Upstairs had another two rooms, along with a walk-out balcony attached to the master bedroom. Most of my time there was spent either in the living room, kitchen or master bedroom. I never ventured into the other rooms and always kept the doors leading into them shut. Open doors to dark rooms always creeped me out. Anyway, the third day came around and I was going through my usual routine of playing with my dog, playing games and watching DVDs. That day it was pretty heavy snow so I didn't feel like trekking down the hill to the main road in my car and decided to stay in. That's when things started getting a bit weird. In our area, there were only two other cabins adjacent to ours, maybe a block away from each other. 
All other cabins aside from these two were about a mile away from ours. Surrounding us was mostly forest and very tall pine trees. Both these cabins were empty and from the past couple of days I knew that no one was currently staying there. Around midday, while outside with my dog, I noticed what looked like footprints in the snow around the area surrounding our cabin. It was still snowing, so the footprints looked semi-fresh, like someone had been there in the last 20 or 30 minutes before me. I thought that maybe someone was staying in the cabin near me that I may not have noticed. Maybe they were shut-ins like me. All right, whatever. The prints lead away from my cabin, and they disappeared in the snow towards the denser part of the trees. I disregarded the footprints and went back inside. Night time came around and I decided to head to bed. My dog was laying on the bed with me when I noticed his ears perk up to a standstill or listening position. This was followed by him quickly jumping off the bed and running downstairs to the living room. I lay in bed and stayed silent. I was kind of freaked out and I could hear him moving around downstairs back and forth. After about five minutes, he ran back upstairs to me and started to do his doggy dance for the sign that he had to pee or wanted to go outside. Well, fine. I can't say no to him, so we both went downstairs to the outside driveway for him to do his thing. Only, he didn't want to pee. As soon as we were outside, he started to pull on his leash, trying to drag me to where he wanted to go. He kept looking into the dense part of the trees where the prints had been earlier, but he also kept sniffing the side of the house and looking up towards the roof. After he figured out that I was not going to go where he wanted, he sat himself down and just stared into the darkness. A bit unusual for him, but okay. Maybe there are forest animals out there that he wants to chase down. But screw this, I didn't want to chance anything, so I pulled him back inside and we both headed back upstairs. Around half an hour later, I was lying in bed when I heard what sounded like hooves walking on my roof. It was only a series of about six steps, and I rationalised that it could be a pine cone falling from a tree onto the roof, or maybe a kind-hearted forest animal running around. But here's the thing. The steps seemed to be spaced apart like a man-length stride, so it was really freaking me out. My dog also heard the noise and was quick to run to the balcony screen door, expecting me to let him out. All right, all right, you know what? I'm a tough guy, and at the time considered myself to be fairly well built and strong enough to handle myself. So I grabbed my coat, shoes, along with my cigarettes and flashlight, and went out onto the balcony. As soon as I was outside, I lit up my cigarette and started canvassing the roof with my light. Nothing there, and the snow on top was undisturbed. Weird must have been all in my head. What about my dog hearing the noise? Maybe he was feeding off of my fear or paranoia. I started to calm down and relax again. My eyes started to adjust to the darkness and I kept smoking and just staring at the stars and trees next to our cabin. And that's when I saw it. In a tree that was a little taller than our cabin and around 20 feet from the balcony, I saw what looked like a man crouched in a squatting position in between two branches. It was squatted on one branch and its arms were extended above its head, holding onto the branch above it. What the hell is that? I wasn't sure if I was really seeing this thing and stood just staring and sat there motionless. I noticed my dog stand up and start pacing behind me and lightly barking at the same time. The thing still did not move. I put my cigarette out and was debating on shining the light in the thing's direction but something in my head kept screaming not to, so I walked backwards to the inside of the room and pulled my dog in with me. Once inside, I locked the door and shined the light in the thing's direction, but there was nothing there. I shut the curtains to the screen door and retreated back to bed, but later on that night, I heard light tapping at the screen door, like someone was tapping on the glass with their fingers. It was consistent and did not stop for nearly an hour. My dog seemed to stare at the door, but he wouldn't go near it anymore. The weirdest part was, I had a feeling like someone was inviting me to open the door, but at the same time, I kept hearing my dad's voice in my head telling me to stay in bed and not to do it. I listened to my dad's voice and just stayed there where I was. I passed out eventually and woke up in the morning and everything was normal. 
The rest of the week I spent there was non-eventful, and nothing else out of the ordinary happened. I totally admit that it could have been all in my head. A lot of stuff was going on at the time, so I was pretty messed up from all the drama, but still bugs me even now after a lot of times passed. I'm married now and have two young kids, but I'm still afraid of the dark.